Hello and uh, welcome back to our live coverage of the United Nations Climate Talks here in Cancun, Mexico. I know it's not obvious that we're in Cancun in this grey warehouse, but I promise that we are. Um, I'm delighted to say that I've been joined by uh, Claudia Gamena Roa um, from Colombia. You work for an organisation called Funda Expresión. I hope I've got the pronunciation right. And uh, Nina Somera. Um, from the Philippines and you're here with Gender CC Women for Climate Justice so uh, thank you both for um, joining uh, me here. Uh, we're going to uh, continue our discussion about gender and climate change and get some personal insights from uh, the two of you on, on your experiences um, but uh, first of all I wanted to ask you uh, how you feel about these talks, what's it like being here and uh, I know both of you have attended previous climate conferences, I think you were in Copenhagen and Poznan and uh, Nina you were in, in Copenhagen so what are your impressions of, uh, of Cancun so far? Claudia, I'll ask you first. Okay, I have many, many thoughts in my mind because I think it's, it's a little bit of, uh, of crazy because the world doesn't know what's really going on here. And the common people in my country, they hardly get to know what, what is this about. And the topics, uh, you would think is people, uh, let's say, forest uh, being uh, given money uh, talking about how carbon trading and all these things so it's, it's a little bit uh, mixed feelings because uh, on, on the one hand you meet very interesting people people who are doing a lot of work for nature for communities for cultural identity on the other hand you see that people some people are really interested in just money mm -hmm. and how they get more money from these issues from every tree has a, a value mm -hmm. every plant has a value so people don't see this as that we have the right, that we have the right to to, to have uh, nature, to preserve Mother Earth, and and that doesn't doesn't have any value because this has been protected for for years, for generations. So this is something. Mixed feelings. And, and Nina, how do you feel this compares to Copenhagen? Okay, for me, I think the energy is significantly much much lower than in Copenhagen. Primarily because in Copenhagen there was a huge expectation that a deal would be made but as we know it the talks bogged down in Copenhagen and and it, it did it did not just um, bog down just that but then in a way the process was overtaken by just a few developed countries so there was so much frustration and out of that frustration was also the low expectation in this talks whether there would be a significant deal that would result from the two weeks of um, negotiations and also the process before the two weeks of negotiations. And then another important thing to note also is the is also the effort to to quiet down civil society organizations. As you probably know, the venues are very much separated from each other. So for instance, civil society organizations, I believe there are three venues. And these are very far. These are very far from each other, and then it, they're also very far from from Cancun Mese and the and the and Moon Palace, where the where the official negotiations are going on. And it also doesn't help that Cancun Mese and Moon Palace are separate, because in Copenhagen, um, the side events are happening in the same venue where the official negotiations are happening, and that was and that was, and that was very good because at least uh, the parties could easily, you know during their breaks could go into the side events and, and mingle with civil society organizations. But here, it's quite impossible to do that because they only come here to have their badges validated and then go ahead to Moon Palace. It's something that lots of people have, have raised, actually. Um, I'll remind our viewers that uh, we're broadcasting live from Cancun, and so you can interact with us. Um, if you want to send in your comments, you can do so on oneclimate.net and then uh, forward slash Cancun. Um, and I'll also be monitoring Twitter for the hashtag one climate so if uh, you have any questions or comments then uh, send them in um, before uh, I noticed we've had one comment already but before we respond to that Claudia I wanted to uh, pick up on your observation about um, giving everything a value and uh, saying every tree has a value and, and every, every some kind of economic uh, uh, price to everything because yesterday evening we, we um, had a discussion about um, businesses role in climate change and um, uh, the importance of, of companies uh, doing something about climate change. But I found it quite a difficult discussion because I recognize that I think businesses do have to have a role because I don't think we can overturn the entire economic system quick enough for, uh, for 
some kind of big global revolution which would solve climate change. I'd like from a from a perspective where I live in in, in Britain, that doesn't seem realistic. And so we we need we need. Uh, we need businesses to have a, a progressive role, but then there's another part of me which says, hang on, if we want businesses to, to have a, um, a positive role here, they have to be able to make a profit because that's what, that's what businesses do. And, and then it seems a slippery slope towards giving everything a value. You, have, you give trees a value, you give carbon a value, you give mangrove swamps a value. Like, what's your perspective on this? Uh, but what about a different type of life? What about a life that many communities have, in, in, for instance, in my country, where people live a life where they enjoy the rivers, enjoy the, the forest, enjoy the mangrove. But what we have seen lately is that no matter what, the disasters are coming, the disasters are there. And 10 years ago, I wouldn't have imagined what's going on in many countries, and especially in my country, where there are floods, where there are, there are places where it's dry, and, and at the end, you won't be able to eat money. You, you will be able to eat food, you will be able to give your children a nice landscape. So what is business about? I mean, why, why don't we stop for a moment and say, let's preserve what we have, and let's do another type of business that doesn't mean to get rich, filthy rich, and that doesn't mean that the people in the north have to have a, 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 the type of life that you are leading. This is what I would like to tell the people from the UK and the people from, from Europe and North America, that you should stop and think, come on, we need to give a break to this world and we need to protect the forests that, are, that people are protecting. So we just leave people alone, mm -hmm. what, minding what they are doing, and stop thinking just about money. I mean, profits, yes, but no, no extreme profits, like we have seen. This, this culture of, of profit and of consumerism seems so fundamental to um, the way of life in, in many rich countries in America, in, in, in the UK and Europe. Um, and uh, I don't know if you were in, in Tianjin in China for the intercessional um, meetings that we also covered live last month, but it seems that many of the big developing countries, you can also see signs of consumerism really taking a grip um, a, a, as they emerge into, into new powers. Do you think that it's realistic that, that you can expect people's values and, and principles to shift so quickly when you call on people in the UK to stop and think about nature? Do you think that will happen? It, it will have to happen when you see that the catastrophes and disasters are there. I mean, I don't want to show a, just a pessimistic side because we would like to show also the optimistic side that we still have forests, we still have indigenous people, we still have cultures that want to continue the way they have been. Like there are people, there are cultures in the Amazon that they don't want to be contacted. They know that we are here, but they don't want to be contacted. Why? Because they realize we are not intelligent enough to say, let's stop, let's think about what we are doing, and let's change our lifestyle. Let's not buy bottled water, so mm -hmm. not all the time bottles, mm -hmm. water. Yeah. The, uh, let's, water is not for sale. Mm -hmm. I mean, water is a human right, a fundamental right. Mm -hmm. So why should you buy water? And I'm going to ask you both about your experiences in your own countries now. Nina, what was it um, about your life in the Philippines that made you um, engaged with the issues of climate change? Why did you become interested in this? Um, because prior to this, I've been engaged in women's organizations and women's issues. So back in Copenhagen, I was with a, with a feminist communications organization, although that one was a regional organization, so it wasn't just focused on the Philippines. But then I also started um, trying to make a link between reproductive health and climate change. So that has been a topic of my, re of my recent re research. So um, aside from that, I've also tried to make a link between, um, because we've made a link between women and climate change, but I've also seen that there's also something about sexuality and climate change. In Copenhagen, um, there, was, there were at least two groups who were calling for population control as a measure in order to address the, the current climate crisis. And I personally, of course, as a, as a women's rights advocate, I found it quite ridiculous and I tried to do some, some more research about it and linked up with other groups who are now becoming more engaged in the climate talks because they're trying to look at that angle that, mm -hmm. I, that we hope that it wouldn't, re it wouldn't really be become a measure that you know, countries would 
developed countries would adopt just in the name of climate change. I'm just actually looking at um, a report that was uh, emailed to me this morning uh, they're saying uh, a new report that's come out from the Centre of Global Development and they argue that actually uh, family planning for girls and education combined would be a really effective way if you had if you are investing money in climate change um, to to save CO2 emissions. So what is this? You say you've been looking at, at the, the role of, of uh, gender and, and um, reproduction. Like, what's your perspective on this? Okay. Family planning and addressing reproductive health needs of women are quite important, especially um, in the context of disasters or in building women's resiliency to climate change. However, it is one that, that is one thing, but it's another when you say uh, population control is a measure to curb greenhouse gas emissions and yeah, as a response to climate change. Because if we look at closely, uh, developing countries usually have a higher rate of population. We also have a higher number of population compared with developed countries. But then developing countries also have the lowest emissions per capita. So so that's where that's where we find where's the link there? Like how how would you link high population growth with greenhouse gas emissions? So that's one. And then another also is that uh, before Copenhagen there was a study saying that um, we have to have lesser children because we have to think of our um, carbon carbon legacy. That's that's a term that they that they use, meaning uh, carbon legacy. So, so the children that you would have, the, the carbon emissions that, that they would um, they would produce, that would also be, you know, that would also be charged on you. And and I think that why why would you charge that against women's bodies again? <laughs> why, why why in the name of why in the name of women? And um, and and all of these are actually directed to women from the global south. We don't. We, these measures are not really directed to, you know, to, to all to all segments of population, but it's just in a particular segment, like women from the developing world, and that's where we see the discrimination there. And and when we talk about um, when we talk about issues of sexuality, we also have to keep in mind that the poor also have their own. They also deserve to be sexually happy. You know? <laughs> a good way of putting it. I'm just going to um, respond to some comments that have yeah. been coming in. It says, great to hear from women who really feel and understand the importance of looking for a more natural earth rights mm -hmm. perspective. Um, people of developed nations need to empathize with struggles of people in developing countries. Like your guest says, developed nations need to stop and think about what we value. It seems like people are enjoying what you're saying. Uh, and then, hi guys, how do you see these talks progressing uh, towards a, a legally binding treaty? Well, I'll come back to that one in a second. Um, first of all, I want to ask you um, about uh, the impacts of climate change in your countries and how women are experiencing them. Um, and then we'll uh, talk a little bit about um, the solutions and how, how women uh, are contributing to uh, solutions on a day-to-day -day basis. And then perhaps as part of that, we can come to uh, uh, the, the possibilities of a treaty and, and women's role within the treaty. So Claudia, um, first, you're from Colombia. Uh, yes. how, how is climate change uh, affecting people in Colombia? Uh, a lot, because at the beginning, when I started uh, dealing with climate change, uh, and also my issue was related to poverty mm -hmm. and wealth. And sometimes we think poverty, it, it has to do with no money and wealth with money. Mm -hmm. But I realized that no, now that we had in Colombia a lot of wealth because we have a lot of biodiversity, mm -hmm. we have a lot of plants, you can still walk a luxurious landscape, mm -hmm. a beautiful green, all sorts of greens, all sorts of uh, colors. So I felt we are not really poor, we are rich. Mm -hmm. And the other way around, when I, when I visited Europe, I say, okay, all these buildings have a lot of history, okay, mm -hmm. because it's a cultural patrimony. But our history also has to do with, with our, our way of, of living, our way of preserving uh, our ecosystem. So when we started saying, uh, at a school they say, uh, like, the snow, snow peaks that you will never uh, endless mm -hmm. the, the the snow will always be there uh -huh. when we st uh, study geography uh -huh. and little by little i started seeing that no 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 every time the the snow was melting and uh -huh. less and less we had plenty of water and less and less we see uh, dry, dry seasons very strong mm -hmm. and we started working a lot with women mm -hmm. we always work because we think uh, 
these issues, women are very powerful. We are very powerful uh, preserving seeds, uh, cooking, or, uh, thinking about how our uh, food, uh, how do we can use so many things that we have in nature. So this, this thing, little by little, every year is, is worse. This year we have the worst flooding ever in Colombia. In one day, it rained 500 more times than in one month, the whole month of November, in one just day. So we have, everything is blocked, the roads, businesses are blocked because they cannot sell anything. Mm -hmm. so, so people are just looking for food, yeah. looking for a shelter. And this is what is happening, is going to happen to Earth. So by the time we say, let's think about how we can survive, how we can be in harmony with nature. So this is how we can continue living if we want to survive as a species. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the World Meteor Meteorological um, Organization yesterday um, said that uh, the last year is the hottest ever on record, they think. And I noticed that Colombia um, broke its national um, heat record uh, last year as well for um, average temperature. So, or sorry, hottest day, I think it was. So like, there, I think people are starting to, to draw the links now between climate change and, and impacts on separate countries. Um, Nina, I'm going to ask you about the impacts of climate change on the Philippines. But first of all, I just wanted to respond to this comment, or rather, it's somebody responding to, to your observation. She says, rich people think of themselves so selfishly. They have sex lives whilst poor people have population problems. So <laughs> quite a succinct summary. Um, Nina. The, 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 the problems that you're experiencing in Philippines, is that one of the reasons why you decided to, to come here and, and kind of can you explain for our viewers like how is climate change impacting people in the Philippines? Oh, it, it, it impacts us in different ways and it depends also on the sectors. So in the Philippines I am a member of a national coalition called Action Clima Pilipinas. The English translation is Climate Action Philippines. And then we just had a set of national consultations and we've tried to collect all the experiences of the different um, organizations, farming, fisheries and indigenous groups. And for farming, for the farmers, they're saying that first the weather has been quite erratic. So for instance, in the month of August, usually the month of August is a monsoon month, so it's, a rain, it's, a, it's, it's always raining every day. But then the farmers are saying that there's one week in August when there should be no rain, mm -hmm. when it should only be, there should only be sunlight, but then that one week has, is, is now gone. Mm -hmm. And they could no longer predict the calendar, the planting calendar. And even, of course, of course they have no choice but to just plant because otherwise they would have no other source of livelihood. But then they could also feel the losses econ economically because, you know, the, the more delayed your planting season is and the lower yield you get from your farms, then the return of investment is quite small. And then in fi for the fisher folks, they're saying that, of course, the water is getting warmer. The fish are always there at the farther side of the sea. So the, usually the men who are the who who go out, to the, who set out to the sea, would have to set out much, much farther. And if you could see the, if you could see the boats there in the Philippines, these are the, the most, that, the best that you could have are motorized boats. But that, but that's it. It's not, it's not really, it's not really something safe to, safe to be in if you're going to set out much farther. And also the, the communities near the coast many of them have already been evicted and, and they had to go to a higher ground because water has already encroached that part of the that part of the shore where they are and aside from that it has also contaminated the, their water the fresh water sources and then for women we also find some discriminat discriminatory practices that are being intensified by climate change so in industrial plantations uh, Usually the women make a living out of, for instance, the fish fry in some of the big fish, fish ponds and, then, um, and also in the sugar plantations. But then the wages are different between men and women. And so if there are, if there are lesser yields because there are less you know, crops in a, in, in a farm, the chances are it would be men who will be employed. Of course there will be fewer men, but certainly there will be much, much fewer women. And even with that, the wages of women are still smaller than those of men. 
You've, you've both spoken um, about the impacts of, of climate change in your countries, but um, for many people in the rich world, they just they don't they don't see it on a day to day basis, and I think people find it difficult to um, accept that climate change is happening. If you look at polls coming out in the US and in Australia and the UK, there is still some skepticism about whether climate change is real and about whether it's man-made. Um, what would you say to people watching who, who aren't experiencing climate change yet, or, or at least don't, don't realize that they're experiencing it? Is there anything you can say to them to encourage them to, to, to empathize or to explore this issue further? Uh, yeah, I would like many people to see the images of what, uh, in, what, uh, what is going on in Bangladesh, what is going on in Pakistan, uh, what is going on even in, in Belgium. Mm -hmm. You don't need to go further. I mean, Belgium, you, you know the floodings mm -hmm. there, uh, the situation of the erratic way of the weather. And the problem is that people still are, have the comfort. But once that comfort is not going to be there anymore, so what's going to happen? Even England, is, is a, because it's an island, it's, mm -hmm. it's, anything can happen. So I think it's just people to realize, to think a little bit deeper, to, to read more, because I think the, 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 this is our problem. We get so much information, but at the, end, at the end we are misinformed. We don't know what's going on. When we come to Cancun, like the tourists, the tourist, like tourism is, is basically another problem, how people want that the, the spots where they go mm -hmm. is how their countries are. Mm -hmm. So they come to Cancun, and they want to see the malls, they want to see a comfort, but they don't see the real world, they don't see the problems of the people, they don't get involved with the local people, and they don't see the problems. The, 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 the cities become like, uh, they show just the rich part. Mm -hmm. You see here in Cancun only the rich part. You don't go to see how the, the, the poor people live. Even the, the people who clean here, uh, I was talking to the cleaners of the mm -hmm. toilets. Is how much money does, does, does one lady make? Mm -hmm working getting out getting up at 3 a.m mm -hmm. and going back home at 11 p.m i was just talking today to one woman 15 dollars and that's a lot for some people no it's the, it's the price of a sandwich here almost yeah so that's 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 why we would like to compare yeah but still i don't want to talk about poverty as as as, as people want to say ah oh, poor people no we are rich mm -hmm. we people are rich i mean we have a lot to give a lot good but uh, we, if we had preserved uh, our planet, we would have the best weather of Earth. Uh -huh. Yes. And do you think there's an, an irony that the talks are taking place here in Cancun? Because it's like a, I don't know, it's like a small chunk of the most unsustainable part of America, isn't it? These huge beach resorts and people flying in every day for luxury holidays, and and the the Moon Palace, which is the venue for the delegates' negotiations, is this massive five-star resort. Um, do you think that, that that's affecting the tone of the talks? Has it affected people's ability to participate? We've heard some organizations in Mexico saying that maybe Cancun was chosen because it's more difficult for indigenous um, leaders to, to get here. Like, what, what do you make of, of the selection of Cancun as the location? I think that's part of the issue, because if they would have selected another city or another, even Guatemala or another country, may, the, because we have other type of events, alternative events like the social forums, and we see that the presence is massive. Mm -hmm. People go on the streets, people they do many activities, because we can still join, enjoy life, but the problem is that everything is so much security, 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 so it's, it's really like you, you say, what, what is this? This is crazy, uh -huh. this is crazy. A reminder of you is that you're uh, watching the One Climate Channel. We're broadcasting here in partnership with Tick, Tick, Tick and Link TV. Um, and uh, it's an interactive channel. You can send in your questions and comments. We've already had some uh, uh, really good ones already. Uh, you can do that using the hashtag One Climate on Twitter um, or via our chat box. Um, uh, just a, a quick observation in light of your, your comments. This this uh, this warehouse that we're broadcasting from now it doesn't inspire a, kind of a connection with nature, does it? Really, it's not. Uh, in many ways, I kind of I wonder if uh, delegates might uh, might uh, these these talks might progress a little bit faster if, if the the locations weren't quite so soulless. Um, I want to move on now to talking about. Um, the uh, solutions that are being put forward to uh, deal with climate change and uh, women's role in those in these solutions and also uh, the impacts of, of some of the solutions. I know that, uh, Claudia, you're very passionate about the issue of, of forests, so we'll come to that in a moment. But do you think that, that women have a specific role um, when it comes to, to trying to address this problem? OK, 
okay certainly we have a, we have a role to play in the whole in the current climate crisis and in these talks financing has been the highlight even even in the in the prior cops but then when we come to think of it there are so many women in indigenous communities and even local communities who have made it their lifestyle to protect the environment without any financial support from the government. And that's one thing that we need to, to keep in mind. And then another also is that, um, also in terms of, of financing, uh, we feel that any actions that, that, would be, that would address the climate crisis should not be should not be determined by the financing negotiations. It, should, it shouldn't be used as a reason to stop addressing even the more basic problems like access to land, access to water, uh, citizenship is issues, and even conflict issues. So we, let's also look at the broader picture beyond, beyond, the, beyond this warehouse. <laughs> yeah. And, and what about you, Claudia? What, what kind of role do you think women have in, in the, the solutions that are being implemented uh, with regards to climate change? Okay, uh, basically what we would like to say is that even if without the negotiations, uh, associations of women, many women are working on real, giving real solutions to climate change, mm -hmm. preserving, uh, looking after what the, the water uh, springs, uh, looking after families, looking after all what it, the culture means. Even when we, we think about when you go to see to different communities, you see that women are the ones who preserve more their their costumes, their traditions, mm -hmm. they, they, and they feel proud of, of, of their tradition. So I think it's, it is important to say that. Let's say these this, uh, negotiations started 16 years ago. So we have been fighting for longer than that. We, we, we were, I mean, many groups, organizations, associations, uh, common people have been fighting for, for, uh, for all these issues. So that doesn't mean that we have to say, oh, why, how does the government have to support us? No, we are supporting many of the things that, that, that we have. Many of the things that have been built have been because of community, not because of only governments. Of course, government have to have, uh, have a, an obligation, mm -hmm. but we also have the our duty is to continue doing what we are doing. And, and what do you think about the solutions that are being suggested here at, at the United Nations? So um, I'll give our, our viewers a, a bit of a, a preview as to what's coming up later in the week. On Sunday it's, it's World Forest Day and on the Monday we're going to try and um, dedicate as much of the show as possible to uh, forestry. And, and there's a, a controversial set of policies being discussed here known as RED um, about reducing emissions uh, through deforestation and degradation. Um, and what are the impacts uh, on women of, of these policies, Claudia? Well, a lot, because uh, as, as we know, uh, every decision that is being made here will affect women because uh, we say most of, the, most of the poor population, the poorest are women. But I would like to say something that it might be very strong, <laughs> that it says that we have like a sort of colonial way, mm -hmm. neo-colonial or colonialism to decide. Because culture, like we say, is everything is homogeneous. Mm -hmm. Everything is the way we want. We want business, we want profit, mm -hmm. and this is it. So this is what some people want to continue con consuming, and they don't understand that there are other types of lives. So also how we negotiate. Communities have negotiated or making agreements a long time ago without signing, mm -hmm. without, okay, I'm going to, buy, to sign this paper. No, because the, 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 the tradition, the word counted, mm -hmm. Well, if I said to you, I will come tomorrow, I will come tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yes, we didn't need to sign anything. Uh -huh. No, this is the European way. Okay, sign here, and and communities don't know how to how to how what this paper says. Yes, so this is a, a way how the world has been since the colonial time, and we are still doing the same. I can vouch for the fact that we didn't sign anything to agree this meeting, and you were here exactly on time. So, <laughs> thank you. Um, and, and what about uh, you, Nina? Do you think that the solutions being suggested here at, at the UN are, are, are the, we're on the right track? Do you think that they are they take women into account sufficiently? Because um, we spoke earlier to, to um, another guest who said that women's participation in these talks isn't sufficient. They're, they're, uh, the lead negotiators are, are mainly men, and she felt that, that that might affect the tone of the talks as well. Um, so do you think the outcomes of the talks are taking women's particular circumstances into account enough? Really, 
At the moment, uh, I'm not so optimistic, especially with the solutions that are being forwarded. Um, for me, they largely evade the, the basic issues, and the basic issues are historical responsibilities. As Claudia said, uh, right now we are in a neo-colonial environment, <laughs> and uh, yeah, historical negotiations and common, common but differentiated responsibilities, and they keep on evading these issues because if they if they really face the, these issues up front, then they wouldn't be they, there wouldn't be so much time debating on carbon-based, carbon market-based solutions. And uh, for instance, RED. Uh, for us, RED is, RED is not a solution because, uh, because we've seen how the clean development mechanism, that it, it's a, it's a carbon-based mechanism that was provided by the Kyoto Protocol years ago. It has not been very effective in radically reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And in fact, it has only it, it, it has only enriched already rich companies and already rich countries. And if we if we make another another type of mechanism in the in the in the form of red, then what can we expect out of it? And then another also is that um, developed countries are still very are still uh, hell bent in giving out you know the money that they need to give as as form of reparations for developing countries. And that has been that has been you know going on ever since I guess ever since this COP has started, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. And that's something which we'll we'll try and look at the um, red the, the the set of policies to uh, try and address deforestation. We're going to yeah. talk about on Monday, and also uh, the issue of climate finance and the fact that um, this money that's been promised by rich countries over and over and over again just isn't delivered um, is also something that we're going to uh, 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 mention. Um, I'm going to ask you in a second um, what gives you hope and uh, why you, why you believe that we can still uh, solve this problem. Um, and that's, I'll, I'll finish the interview of that. But just before we we wrap up, um, I'll, I'll look at a couple of the comments. Um, somebody saying that uh, you're right; uh, it's mostly misinformation or irrelevant information that we hear, and we need pictures of what is uh, really most important for the human family and pictures of what we really value to inspire us. So somebody calling for us to reach. Uh, Reach, uh, reach inside a little bit more um, and uh, the coverage is great I'm writing down tons of names and organizations and videos to follow up on so thank you very much uh, for that feedback that's nice to hear um, so just to wrap up and I'm sorry for keeping you so long um, it's been a really interesting discussion though just to wrap up what gives you hope uh, Nina I'll, I'll start you first because it seems like there's a uh, huge challenges um, uh, well for everybody but um, for women specifically and that even some of the solutions that are being proposed uh, uh, come with challenges in them um, so, so why are you hopeful? We all have to be hopeful in the first place because otherwise we, can, we cannot just let this process take its, take its course without engagement. And, it, and, and I think that's where we also draw our own empowerment, that we cannot say that we just, we, we, we just ignore the whole process. At least we've done something in the process. And, uh, and also because I feel that even even among even among the delegates themselves, they know what is right. But it's just that the interest of capital is is just so tempting. But but we know what we know really what's right for the planet. And and I hope that it also, despite although civil society is quite segregated at this time, and, and it's so difficult for us to to show our own solidarities given you know the physical constraints. Uh, it's really important to to make the delegates feel that they are being watched mm -hmm. and that they are not just doing the, these negotiations for themselves, but there are populations depending that they have to be accountable for. And that's what we, we have to keep on reminding them. That's why it's important that we be present in these spaces and we make the most out of the limited space that is given to us. Yeah. And, and Claudia, what, what gives you hope for these for these talks and for uh, communities worldwide uh, dealing with climate change? Well, what it gives me hopes is like yesterday we had a meeting uh, with an indigenous person from Bolivia and he said, and uh, there was a woman and a man and they were talking about that. We only have one nationality and it's Mother Earth. Although I, we are sometimes very strong about, well, how decisions are made, how some countries are using their power. We know that normal citizens, common people like, like you, like the people who are uh, watching this, 
they have a common sense. They have the idea that we need to protect this, that, that this is our lives that are at stake. So the hope is that also the, the work of communities of everyday life, protecting forests, keeping the, the, the forests that are there, uh, thinking about other species, not just about human uh, kind. So this is what it gives us hope, and the hope that, that, that we need to work together. And we cannot say, be so pessimistic either. We need to say that there are people mobilizing, people from Via Campesina, people who are going to schools to talk about climate change. Every, some, even some people from um, some delegations that have that, that feel uh, something and some people even have drop out of some delegations because they don't feel like what they are doing is right. Mm -hmm. So that gives us hope. Okay, um, well uh, we've spoken a lot about the importance of, of reaching uh, deep inside and, and recognizing that things have value beyond their economic worth. Um, so I'm going to uh, tell our viewers about um, a uh, initiative called Mosaic Earth which is uh, on the Tick 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 website and it allows them to upload images uh, of what, what matters to them in this world and to, to share that. Um, so I'd encourage our viewers to, to go and visit that. Um, Nina and uh, Claudia, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a really interesting discussion.